I would like to formally welcome you to the last in the series on the Essential Biodiversity Variable Course, uh, organized under the JVF Capacity Enhancement Support Program to Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria, and Mauritania. Today is the last in the series. I will not attempt a summary, but on the first day, we had a fantastic talk on an introduction to the essential biodiversity variables, the concepts, the classes, and some detailed account on some of these classes. Yesterday was another fantastic day. We had a work example on the essential biodiversity class species populations, specifically species abundance and distribution. And I like the selected example because changes in species distribution and abundance affect almost all aspects of biodiversity, including the loss of potentially significant traits and functions and associated ecosystem consequences. Also patterns of biodiversity of spatial distribution and changes to these patterns affect the commonness, the rarity and potential extinction risks for species and determine the national and regional stewardship of species and are key to ensuring effective monitoring, protection and population connectivity of species. And lastly, species distribution abundance have a range of other applications in science and society and facilitate application-based biodiversity discovery, learning and citizen science. Today, we will look at the challenges and some complexity. Obviously, from yesterday's work example, I think we all do understand the clear need for good data, research data in developing the essential biodiversity variables. But there are challenges and complexities. And so today, uh, we will have another fantastic talk from um, our resource person, Professor Peterson on biodiversity data leakage compared with opportunities for building data resources. And finally, we will have a discussion on developing the essential biodiversity variables for a region or a nation. It's going to be interactive so that we do not just come to those calls and receive a set of talks, nice, fantastic talk, uh, work example, but how we can practicalize this uh, in our various countries. So I believe and hope that we will all contribute effectively so that uh, this course will end on a very good practical note. Again, we are privileged to have Professor Peterson, a distinguished, a university distinguished professor at the University of Kansas. Um, he will take us through uh, the talk again. And so Professor Peterson, we are happy for you to give us your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, I'm really glad that we had a, a nice um, set of conversations before Alex just started us formally. Seems like everybody's in a very social mood. And that's exactly what I was hoping for today, that now, I'm going to give you a little bit of, a, of a, a kickoff, but then I really would like to have some more intensive time um, in which we can exchange ideas about how to, how to overcome some of the barriers and how to create some very real, tangible, meaningful data resources. So... Let's, let's just think together just a bit. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and take you back to a slide from, from Monday morning. And just remind you of what these EBVs are. And this is, this is a, not an easy challenge, okay? Uh, genetic composition, species populations, species traits, community composition, 
ecosystem function, ecosystem structure. Now, um, you could say, let's start with the easy ones. There are none, okay? To do them comprehensively of these six, there is, there is no one of them that you would say, oh, this is the easy one, let's just knock it out quickly. Um, but we can talk about these two at the end pretty quickly and easily. And so let's, let's go look at one resource, sorry. Um, this, is a, this is a very interesting data resource. The Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer, or MODIS. And essentially MODIS has some really interesting characteristics. If you look at satellite imagery, they go, you, you have to think about spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and spectral resolution all at once. And so for spatial resolution, they go from things that are accurate down to centimeters, which the, the military guys have and, and nobody else. And then, you know, you all are familiar with Landsat. That's at about 30 meters resolution. MODIS is at 250 to 500 meters resolution. And then there are others that are coarser still. So you'd think, well, right away, let's go down to, you know, Landsat or finer. But then you have to think about temporal resolution. Landsat images the whole surface of the Earth every 16 days. And so a given place only gets imaged every two weeks or more. And, you know, if that day is cloudy, then it may be a month. And some places on Earth are cloudy or hazy much of the year. And so it may be very difficult to get any imagery. Now, MODIS covers the whole surface of the Earth every day. And that, to my view, is a, is a massive advantage. Because it means that if a day or even a week is socked in with clouds, uh, MODIS can get imagery fairly close in time. And then the spectral resolution, that's another one that's very complicated. Um, for those super, super fine resolution sensors of you know, centimeters to meters, they typically just have essentially like a photograph. They don't split up the electromagnetic spectrum at all. Landsat does a better job, MODIS does a better job. Uh, and then there are other sensors like the, the hyperspectral imagery sensors that split up the electromagnetic spectrum into thousands of bands. And so obviously you can do more with that imagery. So we don't need to go far into this because we're not gonna be able to do much work on these two um, EBVs without some specialists and remote sensing involved. But I just wanted to show you the data that are readily available. Um, so, so focus on the land products in the middle and you can see land cover products. Let's go there. This is going to get us to ecosystem structure, but these are uh, classified uh, land cover summaries for the whole world. And you can look at those, those land cover classes through time. And you see they come in three different resolutions, half a, meet, half a kilometer, a kilometer, and you know about five to seven kilometers. Uh, so right away we have, when we go back to look at our EBV list, oh, sorry, here we go. Habitat structure, ecosystem extent and fragmentation, ecosystem composition, we have some ways of getting at those questions essentially immediately, okay? Now, the next to the last EBV was ecosystem 
function. And even there, I don't know how to get to this. Okay. Um, even there, notice we have gross primary productivity. We have evapotranspiration. We're getting to some ecosystem properties. Okay. Not everything, but we're getting to some. And so really, if we had the, the uh, GIS and remote sensing abilities, we could start in on, on mapping an entire country at 250 meter resolution for several of the dimensions of those two EBVs. So I'm really going to leave those aside. Um, no, we can't be comprehensive and finish those quickly and easily. Yes, it does require a lot of bandwidth as far as, as internet. Yes, it does require a lot of, of uh, computational power, but really those, those EBVs could happen very quickly. So let's look at the other four. I'm gonna deal with two of them, genetic composition and species traits. And these are interesting ones because, you know, people are sequencing DNA every day, um, every moment, in fact. Um, and you all and I have certainly uh, done things relative to species traits like plant phenology, morphology, reproduction physiology, movement. And so these are things that are being done all the time. What they're not, what's not happening is two things, massive comprehensive scale. Like there are very few efforts to, you know, let's say um, sequence the genomes of the 500 dominant plants across Ghana, right? It's just not happening. It's not happening in the US. And the other thing is the data aren't necessarily organized. The data aren't necessarily right there queryable. Remember we talked about the Darwin core and with Darwin core, uh, the brilliant dimension of Darwin core Darwin was that um, it organized one set of data, one type of data very effectively. And that hasn't really been done for genetic composition or species traits. And so those two also kind of have to sit and wait. The two things that could happen to fix them could be uh, that level of community organization, like what we did years and years ago with Darwin Core, that could happen for genetic composition and species traits. That's a global effort. And then the other thing is, you know, projects can be organized to get that comprehensive coverage. You know, the, the 500 dominant forest trees of Benin or whatever um, for evaluating their traits and their genetic traits. That could happen. It's not gonna be easy and it's certainly not gonna be fast. Okay, so that leaves us with these two, species populations and community composition. And these are very interesting ones. Maybe they're interesting to me personally, just because they, they relate to things that I've been working on for decades. Um, they should be very interesting to several of you who also have been working on things of that sort. Which is to say, these are essentially two different views of the same phenomenon. Species populations is to take a taxon and say, where is it? And the community composition is to take a place 
and ask what taxa are there. So if you remember our presence absence matrix that we generated yesterday, it was the, the uh, hexagons from our map, right? It was the ID numbers of those hexagons and a table of that versus the species that were in each of them. And so species composition EBVs are taking, or co community composition, is taking a place and looking across all the species. And the species populations EBV is taking a taxon and looking at it across all the places. So you see both of those really derive from um, the, the PAM, the presence absence matrix that we generated yesterday. Now, it's not comprehensive. For example, that doesn't get you uh, necessarily abundance data or population structure or species interactions, but it gets you a start. Okay, it starts us down that, that path. So in a way we have three types of EEBs sorry, EBVs, um, we have these two in green that really depend on organizing large communities of scientists, uh, organizing the data that they produce, and uh, generating countrywide data sets. We have these two in turquoise that really depend on um, on making major strides with remotely sensed data. And then we have these two in yellow where you saw yesterday, we have 1.6 billion primary data records organized and shared and right at our fingertips. That's big. And you see that one data stream of primary biodiversity occurrence data, that one data stream allows us to address two different uh, EBVs. Those of you who are interested in conservation probably would agree with me that they might also be the most important EBVs, which is to say, <laughs> Knowing the, did I say it wrong again, EBVs? Um, knowing which species are where is really crucial if you're at all interested in conservation. So that's, you know, that's the world according to me. Um, that, that gives me a reason to focus on these two EBVs that are in yellow. Uh, because they are feasibly addressed, the data at least begin to exist, the data are organized, and I don't depend, you don't depend to such a massive degree on, you know, the, the world genomics community getting, uh, getting organized. It's just not going to happen soon. And that was one thing that Jorge Soberon and I pointed out in that paper on uh, EBVs are not global. What we were pointing out was that some of these are immediately feasible and some of these are gonna take a very long time. Okay, so another, well, any, any questions about the, about the different sorts of EBVs. Anybody have any thoughts or questions or, or ideas, or maybe you don't like my classification of them, that's fine. Any thoughts? What are my EBVs? Okay, so I mentioned the first 
Philip, yes, and he did mention the fact that uh, for the, those that are interested in conservation, that they want to know the status Okay, sorry, if that was a question, I didn't understand it. Could you repeat it? Okay. Um, Alex, go ahead, please. Okay, so yes, I get the link between the EBVs uh, relating to species compost uh, populations and community composition. But um, yes, I do agree that those are perhaps the easiest to go with now. But it's worth mentioning at this stage also the taxonomic impediments uh, because we do have a situation where taxonomy has become a subject that it's not attracting many people yet it is core to biodiversity conservation and to ensure monitoring and so on and so forth. So I just want to highlight on this issue also, which will affect achieving or building on that EBV. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Alex. That's a, I, I, was, I was headed in that direction, uh, but it's a really crucial point. You know, I said feasible. I didn't say, um, you know, right at the at hand, uh, which is to say, these are still massive scale endeavors uh, that are that are in front of us. Um, you know, taxonomy is not an exciting, hot field. Uh, you know, finding somebody who's interested in uh, you know, siphonapterids or, or um, some group of beetles or some group of plants it doesn't happen very often. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, it also doesn't necessarily attract the, the interest of funders or university administrators. Um, so it is very, very concerning that um, the flow of expertise into our field may not be very, um, very broad, very, very vibrant. So, yeah, I mean, that, that is going to limit us. Um, it puts the onus on those of us who are based at universities to pass on what we know and get opportunities for younger people to uh, gather, garner this expertise. Um, and that, that's very crucial. And you're, you're quite correct, Alex. Um, what I was about to talk about, we'll, we'll go on to this in a moment, is um, this, this idea of data leakage. And we're going to see yeah. where having numerous taxonomic experts augments the reduction of data leakage, which is, which is to say it, it could massively assist in avoiding leakage and loss. Um, but yeah, that's a very, very good point. Other, other thoughts about these EBVs, these essential biodiversity variables? Okay, let, let's go on a little bit farther then. Uh, yep. I, I want the floor. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Um, the four broad areas uh, which make up the uh, biodiversity uh, connections, uh, starting from the genetic level right through to the ecosystem level. Um, my interest will be on whether you have any standardized uh, format to pick up uh, any variables from these, because these are very broad areas. And I also wonder how long it would take to uh, get this kind of information if 
uh, people are doing this on individual basis and they have their data which uh, they keep to themselves. <laughs> you just touched on one of the very key topics. Um, let me take your first question first. Um, this process of organization. So, so I showed you yesterday Darwin Core. Um, Darwin Core was a an idea that was dreamt up in the late 1990s. And it took from, let's say, 1999 until 2012 for Darwin Core to become a, an international iOS standard. And it was not an easy road. Um, midway along the development of Darwin Core, another idea was proposed. Uh, it, was, it was quite different in its purpose. Darwin Core was aiming to communicate the essence of a biodiversity record. And this other framework was aiming to communicate the complete um, content of a biodiversity record. And so working out the relationships between those two uh, data architectures was very complicated. And it was really thanks in particular to this man, John Wachorek, whom some of, some of you know, um, and John and colleagues uh, essentially worked this out, uh, worked through the, the, the challenges both technically and sociologically, and got it through to the standard that it is now. Now, if we, if we look at other areas, um, genetic composition is probably the, the one that is closest, um, closest to having such a, such a, um, a standard, because there's been, I mean, for one thing, it's one type of data in general. It's, it's DNA sequences. Um, now, obviously there, there are other things in there, but, um, but that basic core structure of how do you report and share um, sequence data, that's largely in place. Um, but then, you know, the population genetic di dimension, uh, the diversity dimension, that's a bit harder to, to communicate. Um, and with species traits, there are some ontologies which are essentially classifications of, of traits of species. And those in theory allow you to communicate, you know, I'm talking about you know, this, this part of a species, um, but the data about those, about those traits, about those pieces of species, they're per perhaps less well organized. And then in both of those cases, you also have the challenge of implementing them massively. And in that case, the primary biodiversity data really got a two or three decade start. Well, a, a, cent a several centuries start if you count natural history museums. And then a decades long start um, ahead of the others because people were accumulating primary biodiversity data for a very long time, um, even before it was possible to share them. So yeah, those are very good questions. Um, and then at the end, you brought up the idea of, you know, how do we deal with this as far as individual researchers? And I think one of the one of the really uh, crucial points about EBVs essential biodiversity variables is that rarely or, or perhaps never will they be something that a single individual does or develops. It's just not feasible. You know, if we're talking about EBVs, any EBV for a place, 
or for a region, you know, a country. These are massive scale endeavors. Other questions? Okay, let me go a little bit farther into data leakage. And this is a this is a um, a paper that I published with with Alex um, and with John Wachorek, whom I just mentioned to you, the author or the the lead in in developing Darwin Core, and um, two colleagues of mine from from Brazil. Um, who are in charge of one of the large biodiversity information networks. Uh, but this really comes out of a, a set of discussions that Alex and I had um, over a number of days. Essentially, how do you optimize the use of the information that you have? And so we got, we, we, we took this the, the, the analogy of imagine you go into your house or your apartment and you want to take a shower, right? And you get all ready for your shower and you open the faucet and all you get is drip, 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 but no nice stream of water to allow you to take your shower. Now, you know, that the city where you live has a, a, you know, a water processing plant and a water tower. And so there's probably plenty of water. But somewhere between that main source and your shower, we have some leaks. And if we have lots of leaks, we, don't, we have no water when we get to our house or to our, our shower. Now, maybe that leak is, is in your house. And so if you go down into your basement and bind up that pipe that's leaking, you go back to your bathroom, open the shower, and you have plenty of water. Okay? But that's only if the leak is right at the end of the pipeline that goes to your house. A bigger problem is what if there are leaks all the way along at the city uh, main, main source, in the pipes that go under the streets, in the pipes that go from the street to your house, and then also inside your house. And so we, we put together this figure, which I kind of like. Um, there's your shower. And then you see the planet with lots and lots of water on it. And we can only use the data or the water that get through this whole pipeline. And so let's just talk through it. Out there in the natural world, there's the whole universe of biodiversity. Of that biodiversity, some of it has been sampled, right? A specimen in an herbarium, for example. But obviously, the vast majority of biodiversity has never been sampled or possibly has been sampled and has gotten lost. Now, of the, of the samples, you know, those, those herbarium sheets, Many, many of them are in non-digital format. Millions of biodiversity data records exist only as that physical specimen. Or it could be as field notes or field lists that are not digital. But some proportion are digital. Now, of the ones that, are, that have been sampled and are digital, some of them have been identified. Many of them have not. You know, if you're the curator in a museum, you definitely, definitely have that 
um, taxonomic backlog where you need to work through the keys and figure out what species is this in that difficult genus. And sometimes you have to wait until a specialist visits your, your institution. Sometimes you have to wait until somebody works out the taxonomy and publishes a new key. But suffice it to say, sampled and existing biodiversity data that have been digitized are not always identified. Now of the ones that have been identified, some of them have been georeferenced. You remember I threw out, I think it was 7,000 records from uh, Nigerian birds yesterday because they didn't have coordinates. Well, that's a process that takes a lot of work and a lot of time. It's not just writing down the latitude and longitude of the place, but it's also developing all of the metadata, like the coordinate uncertainty and things like that. Now, of the data that have been sampled and that exist and that have been digitized and identified and georeferenced, a next question is cleaning. Okay, those Nigerian bird records that came from the Netherlands. Something's wrong in there. It's either the country label or the geographic coordinates. Something's wrong. And so biodiversity data records need to be cleaned. They need to be flagged when there are dubious parts of the record so that users don't misuse data inadvertently. OK. Now we're to the point where we have data, well, biodiversity that has been sampled. The data or the specimens exist. They've been digitized. They've been identified. They've been georeferenced. And let's imagine that on a really good day, they've also been cleaned and flagged. And here's, here's the question that was just asked. What happens if they're not being shared? OK. And so now Alex and I developed this, this kind of flow diagram. It's not necessarily in this order. For example, many times data get digitized and identified and shared, and then later get georeferenced, cleaned, and flagged. That's fine. What we really want is to know how many, how much data exists that are usable. And the reason why this linear flow is very useful is that we can think about, wow, let's imagine that digitization is a bottleneck. Well, the immediate effect of that is that we have fewer usable data than have been sampled or that exist. Or maybe georeferencing is a bottleneck. And so even though we have data that are digital and identified, maybe even shared, we still can't use them for many um, geographic applications. And then the final point that I'll throw out is if this is a linear flow and you have a bottleneck here near the end, if you solve that bottleneck, you immediately increase the usable data. But if you have a bottleneck that's earlier in this flow, like sampling or digitization, that allows data to flow further through the system but if you still have a big leak here at the end, it doesn't change the usable data. And so going back to the shower analogy, maybe the city has big problems with its, with its um, water system. And the city fixes that, and now there's 10 times more water flowing out of the city water plant. Well, if you still have a big leak in your basement, you're not going to get a, a good shower in this morning, right? 
So this, this analogy or this comparison can teach us a bunch of things. Any bottleneck affects potentially all of the system and the usable data that come out. And bottlenecks near the end of the flow, if you fix them, have more immediate and tangible benefits in terms of usable data. That makes sense? Yes, thank you very much. Now that also um, applies to every one of these EBVs. In some of these cases, like the modus data, most of those steps have been solved, which is to say NASA or the European Space Agency or uh, whoever is producing the data stream you wish to use, those data have already gone through uh, digitization. They started digital. Uh, they already have been georeferenced in most cases. They already have been uh, quality controlled. And so it may be a very small additional step of you know, downloading the data, which is a pain in the butt because those data sets are huge, or uh, processing the data into the products that you want. The genetic data, the trait data, those are going to be very, very similar. OK? Those are going to be very similar to the primary biodiversity data that, that Alex and I and our colleagues were talking about. Um, it really comes down to a system in which you have to identify those leaks and you have to fix them. Um, how many of you have watched the, the Lord of the Rings? Is familiar with those movies? Yeah? Okay, you remember dra the dragon at the end of The Hobbit. What do dragons do? They they accumulate treasure and they hoard the treasure, right? And that's, that's something that dragons do where they sit on that treasure for centuries. Okay? And they don't let anybody touch that treasure. Biologists are sometimes like dragons. <laughs> right? We say, no, 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 no. The specimens in my collection are invaluable. I can't just let people have access to them. What? <laughs> or they say, I've spent the last 30 years accumulating this data set on the what of whatever. What do you mean I'm just going to let everybody use my data? What? That's my whole career. That's my whole self-worth. And there's that dragon asleep on his treasure. The dragon doesn't make any use of that gold. And certainly the biologist dragon doesn't make full use of his or her data gold. So we always have to look at ourselves in the mirror and ask, am I being a dragon or am I being something better than that? Shall I shut up and see what you guys have, have in your minds? What are you thinking about this stuff? Can we fix this system? Hello, town. Yes. And this is Alfred again. Yes, please. Yes, I, I have followed the explanations that you have given. Uh, my main concern is uh, the cleaning process. The cleaning process is mainly on the information 
and that is on the museum uh, on the museum material either a herbarium or normal museum and uh, that neglects the information from the other aspects uh, information about the um, uh, the genetics and other things so uh, do i take it from you that um, when the data is said to have been cleaned it is because all the information that is on the um, um, material that is being seen or has been captured uh, you have had all the coordinates and other things that are related to it present so the cleaning process for primary biodiversity data is long and iterative and probably is never finished, um, but you can certainly take important initial steps. And so that's a process whereby we um, look for consistency. And so for example, we might look at the names on our herbarium sheets and make sure that they are consistent with a global list of plant names. Or we might look at the geography and make sure that the geographic coordinates that a record has that ostensibly place it in Ghana, we can make sure that the, that point falls in Ghana and not in Togo, okay? So that's a, that's a process. And in many senses, it's never done because what we really want to do is have some broad initial data cleaning steps. And then every one of us should check the data again as part of our use of the data. But definitely, definitely, I don't want to say that the other realms of data don't need their cleaning steps as well. Um, years and years ago, I looked at the taxonomic data associated with uh, GenBank sequence uh, information, and it was a nightmare. I hope they've made some changes since then, but it was such a nightmare. I didn't go back and look at it. Um, the geographic information associated with GenBank sequence data are a disaster. Okay, there's, there's no appeal to standard formal means of describing a place on the face of the earth. Okay, um, the trait data, obviously those can have their own types of errors. Um, so each one of these realms of data uh, needs its own set of specialists to work through and, and uh, detect obvious errors, fix the errors that can be fixed, and flag the problems that can't be fixed. So thanks, Alfred. That's a... That's a a great set of questions uh, because it means that that we all have a stake in this game. You know, there's 1.6 billion primary biodiversity records out there, and some portion of that huge pool of data applies to the country that one of us might be interested in. Well, we should then be part of improving those data. Now we can improve those data by cleaning them and pointing out problems. You know, no, this, this species is not correct or uh, this locality is actually over there. Um, we, can, we can improve the data by adding to the data. Um, so for example, uh, the specimen data within GBIF, uh, let's look. Um, I'll show you how much get lost within GBIF. Here's our occurrence data. Uh, let's, 
let's pick a country. Um, I stole this tool from one of my granddaughter's teachers. Pick a West <laughs> African country. Um, oh, come on, we have, there we go, Guinea. Sorry, I, nothing against Ghana, but. Okay, so okay. let's go. Guinea. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Let's go to Guinea. There we go. And we have 149,836 results. How many of them have geographic coordinates? Oh, we just lost one third of our data. Okay. And look at where those data are, are georeferenced as coming from. Looks like Liberia has a bunch of, oh no, that's Southern Guinea, okay. But notice that there are Guinean well, records that say from Guinea are scattered across West Africa down here in Tanzania as well. So we went from 150,000 data records to 109 or maybe 100,000. We literally lost a third of our data immediately. So if there were the you know, Guinean Bio Biodiversity Agency, one of the things they can do is step forward and say, okay, those 40,000 records, if we georeference them, we stop one leak in the system and we increase the amount of usable data from 109,000 records to 149,000 records. And then the third thing that we can do, so first was we can detect errors and, and essentially flag and correct errors. We can improve the data with things like georeferencing and the third thing is we can add data sets actively. And you know, in, in Ghana, that's been, that's been a, a, a continent leading effort. Uh, Benin has been a, a, a bright star within Africa. Uh, obviously South Africa has done quite a bit of work. Uh, and others of you are, are involved in these efforts. Omokafe has been involved in, in uh, efforts to create and enable data from Nigeria. Um, but these are, these are challenges where every single one of our countries has data resources that are leaking at some point in this process. And then the fourth thing that we can do is go out and generate new data. Okay, actually go out and do the I, 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 I support I support most of the points that you have made down, but I want you to know that um, the example of Guinea is a very interesting one because um, before the turn of this century, Guinea as a name was used for the whole of West Africa. Yes. And that in itself tells you that um, material that have been labeled as Guinea doesn't necessarily, or don't necessarily belong to the country now called Guinea. Yeah. And, and so I, I support fully this idea of the cleaning. And I believe that um, with this project, yeah, which uh, is being embarked upon, we should be able to place materials where they actually belong. And um, that will give us a very good uh, uh, reporting system uh, within the West African or African region. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Some of those um, Guinean records that are from, that have coordinates that fall elsewhere in West Africa some of them will be very old records that indeed refer to those, those old ways of referring to regions and others will just be errors. 
And, and I'm, I'm certain that both are in there. And that's where uh, those who are interested in those data are probably the best people to fix them. I've never been to Guinea. Um, I've been to West Africa a few times, but I don't have a deep knowledge of the, the geography, especially the history of the names. The um, so one, one thing that Alex and I and others have been working on is the idea of user-motivated uh, biodiversity data capture. And so, you know, and, and we point this out in that leakage paper and then even more in a subsequent paper. Um, Omokafe was an, a, an author of that as well. Um, but if you think of what, what's been done in the biodiversity information world with a few exceptions for a very long time, it's been, well, maybe the major collections from your country are in the British Museum or in the Smithsonian or in the Paris Museum. And so one would basically have to wait until that museum got around to digitizing its data or digitizing the data associated with its specimens. And even in the course of our project, you know, one institution jumped far forward and did an immense amount of work, far more than we expected. And other institutions had promised us that they would do they would do this and this and this step and never did. <laughs> and so it was a very frustrating process because uh, we were we were you know, we had the goal of setting out to digitize plant data from West Africa. And we didn't control our own destiny. When images of herbarium sheets came to our group, our group was amazingly good at digitizing the data and taking those data through a first few steps of cleaning. But it was very frustrating because progress, again, um, the group didn't control its own destiny. You know, I don't like depending on other people. I don't like waiting for other people to do things. And so we've come around to this concept of perhaps major biodiversity information efforts should be impulsed and led by the people who desperately want to use and have access to the information. And so you know, that led to that West African Plants Project, which Alex led and several uh, others were, were participating, where uh, West Africans led the effort to capture West African herbarium data. That was exciting. And now we have a, a proposal pending at the US National Science Foundation to capture and improve essentially all of the African data, not just West African, but African data, leaving out Madagascar and, uh, well, I think the, the term I should use is tropical Africa um, and, and not Madagascar and not the deep south or the north, uh, but capture all African records in US herbaria. But the interesting thing is that you have active participation and leadership from the people who want those data. Um, kind of the, the precursor example, which is a brilliant one, is Mexico's Conabio. And Conabio, which was led by Jorge Soberon, uh, Conabio um, set out 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I guess, 
um, to 30 years ago, to assemble a critical mass of biodiversity data for Mexico. And they did a very interesting set of steps. They provided funding for Mexican researchers to do their research on Mexican biodiversity and create the data resources for deposition at Conabio. And so essentially they said, here's some funding for your research, but research has to have this flow all the way through, you know, yeah, publish the papers, but one crucial endpoint is the data product. And so Conabio did an immense amount of that and generated an immense amount of data. But then they also realized there's an immense amount of Mexican biodiversity data outside of Mexico. And so um, they started funding researchers to assemble databases of Mexican biodiversity from those far-flung institutions. And so my colleagues in Mexico and I spent literally two decades tracking down Mexican collections of birds. You know, we spent months at the British Museum, weeks at the Paris Museum, and you know, literally capturing data from every Mexican bird specimen that exists. And so that was a very early important uh, example of how a user community, maybe it's the government of Mexico, or maybe it's uh, any group of you all as a, as a collective, you know, West African biodiversity scientists, or you know, just those from Nigeria or the Ghanaian government or, or what have you, whatever group. I think a very important step is that you all impulse the capture and improvement of your data rather than waiting for the, the people who perhaps own the specimens out of historical legacy, um, but maybe don't have much research interest in their use or in the data that could come from them. I think that's a really important point. What other questions do you have? What other thoughts? Alex. Thank you, Tom, for those insightful discussions and to Professor Alfredo T. Eboa for bringing his expertise up several years of experience in biodiversity science. Uh, no doubt the EBVs are important for policy and monitoring biodiversity change and biodiversity itself. But I think a crucial point that is coming out from our discussion, it's how uh, the need for good or uh, uh, research grade data in order to build uh, the EBVs. And uh, I think the call which Prof. Yebo had made already, it's, and uh, Tao has also talked about, is that data must be digitized, cleaned, and shared. And there are several opportunities today for us to do that. If we are experts, uh, parties, partners interested in biodiversity, that we should uh, take advantage of to make sure that we have rich information resources. And I would like to use this opportunity to talk about a BITC program, which is uh, a, a training that provides some amount of capacity for people to be able to collect data, to clean data and make this data uh, free and accessible to um, for anybody who wants to use it. Also, JBIF has been very useful in this uh, dimension. And um, of course, this whole exercise is 
in a way being sponsored by JPF. It is an infrastructure that provides the opportunities to collect data and to share it all over the world for the users of whoever wants to use that data. But they do also provide opportunities just beyond collecting the data, opportunities like minimum amount of capacity to be able to use those. And as a region, this is an important point I want us to take home that uh, good research data or fit for use data is required if we are to build the essential biodiversity uh, variables for our regions, for our countries. And thus we can do that only when we digitize and share our data for the usage of all. Um, so that point is well made. But I also want to talk about one aspect perhaps we need to talk a little bit about, um, perhaps two, that is still on capacity building and the need for effective collaborations. Because uh, to be able to actually make use of the data, mobilize data, there is a need for effective collaboration within regions and with other international partners. I don't know what comments people have in relation to that, but I think those are crucial elements. I think that's a really important point, Alex, that I, I certainly had neglected to say explicitly. Um, and that is, you said, research grade data. I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna build on it. Research grade primary data. So, you know, IUCN says, oh, we've, we've put out data on distribution of every bird species on earth, okay? But those data are these funny little polygons, okay? I'll, I'll show you what they look like. Okay, those polygons here for, for Picathartes gymnocephalus, um, those polygons are a description of the range of this species. But this species is not pre present across this entire region. Okay, those are uh, secondary data. Those are data that have been synthesized from primary data. And those data do not enable the full set of science that you guys will want to do and from which you can develop EBVs. You need the unitary primary research grade data in original native format. You need the granules of data. <clears throat> and you never want to work from secondary data. Okay, Jean, I believe, has a question. Thank you very much, Town. Uh, yes, I don't have a question, but I have some comments uh, to, let's say, very different thoughts. First of all, I want to thank you very much because capacity building is a big issue uh, in African countries. And you are trying to tackle this with us, with, uh, let's say, our collaboration. I want to thank you very much and also thank Alex for that initiative. That is very great. And uh, surely we will contribute to that. Uh, I want to say, let's say some words about uh, data leakage and take the example at national level. For instance, uh, uh, as node manager of GBIF, I began to, let's say, to sensitize and talk to, let's say, GBIF partners in countries for data publication. I can say that during the first years, it was quite difficult because people were not willing to tear data. But from uh, let's say year to year, through capacity building to partners, for instance, in data digitization, data formatting, data cleaning as well, 
And also to clearly admit there are advantages in sharing data becoming visible, for instance, on the GBF site and uh, elsewhere. Progressively, they became aware of the, the importance of data sharing. So one leakage at the national level is that we needed to be patient, continue to, let's say, hope, build capacity to partners, stay in contact with them. And uh, actually in Benin, the problem we have is no more the willing of data sharing because you have many, many partners who came in and they are sharing their, actually their data. More uh, of the problem we have come from, let's say, financial resources because people to decide their data, they need a minimum of uh, financial assistance. And we are trying to work on this so that uh, to help people, even from decision from government, to help them, let's say, have uh, a, a minimum of support to decide their, their, their data. And of course, as Alex said, uh, we need the collaboration, cooperation, let's say, between countries at uh, sub-regional and regional level, and also at the international level. We try to work on this so that progressively we'll have massive data, but very clean data. To have clean data, I think we, we need to work on our team, really, because the data come through uh, data, those who are in the different team in the nodes, and then uh, there they put their efforts in cleaning data, uh, correcting taxonomic names, updating them, and then georeferencing them before publishing them. So to have clean data, fit, fit best for use data, so the end user data to have very good data, we need to work on our team at national level so that uh, giving them opportunities for their training, et cetera. So that when data came in, they can continue to make their effort to clean data so that data published can become more and more usable. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, I thank you and thank Alex and thanks to all the participants for that very interesting training. So this is a this is a massive scale endeavor. Um, I have a last word uh, as I come. I have to leave to another meeting. So can I just have a last word? Um, I'm happy that this uh, program is going on for uh, the sub region. And I'm also believing that um, the uh, nucleus or the nuclear group are all members of Gibi. And our role should be uh, to be able to attract the other countries uh, in the West African region to be part of Gibe. Because several years ago, I saw the need for Ghana to uh, participate in Gibe. And as a result, we have been able to have um, a good working condition, you know, which has provided support to uh, many of our uh, individuals. So I will encourage uh, those countries who are participating to also reach out to the other West African countries to be part of the uh, giving. And on that basis, thank you very much, John. Uh, it has been a wonderful experience with you. And also to uh, Alex, who I see almost every day <laughs> for negotiating this. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful questions. <laughs> you are welcome, sir. So this is a massive scale endeavor, okay? This is beyond any individual. Several individuals on this call have made massive contributions, okay? I mean, Ghana and Benin and South Africa are without a doubt leaders uh, across the continent as far as mobilizing data. And yet I bet all three of those countries would say they're what a quarter of the way done, a fifth of the way done. Um, you know, 
it is it is a massive scale endeavor. Other questions, other thoughts? Everybody's being quiet. Ah, Gladys. Yes, so concerning the data mobilization issues, um, I think Zambia is in Southern Africa. So if there's anyone from Southern Africa here, I think there's someone. Um, certainly. Yeah, so I'm actually speaking with a friend of mine we met a long time ago. He's in Zambia, and he I've introduced him to JBS, the data digitization and all that. But uh, I think he will need someone closer to him to be mentoring with the data mobilization. So if there's anyone here, I'd like to get in touch with the person and then we'll see how we'll connect them so that they help with the data mobilization. Okay, I think uh, Gladys can get in touch with me now. Okay. Yeah, so, so in South Africa, we are currently busy. We've got a quite a large project also, which is called the National Collections um, Facility Initiative. And it's an initiative that whereby a number of the museums are in the process of capturing data. Institutionally also, Sanby has captured as far back as the 80s. They've had quite a, a, a significant initiative towards mobilizing their data as well. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I'm more than happy for you to get in touch with me and we can connect on that aspect. Thank you. Some of the discussions we've been having more recently and which we also need to have at the higher level institutionally also is around mass digitization. It's just in its, in its sort of initial phases um, and it's around um, a bit around industrial digitization. And it's a follow on of a, a visit that we had in um, to, to Finland, where we had observed the industrial digitization process. So we've initiated with some of our GBIF nodes as well, some preliminary discussions, which we will be taking forward as well. Um, yeah, I thought just to mention that it's, yeah, it's, it's very, very early early days with regards to that and and mass digitization is a is kind of a a process of riches and poverty also some some uh, types of specimens are extremely amenable to to mass digitization um, for example plants which are basically, you know, a single size, mostly a single size sheet with all the data right on the sheet. And they can very readily be subjected to scanning. And that can make for very quick uh, digital capture. The example would be the Paris Museum, which captured, I think, six million herbarium sheets in in a year or two. Um, obviously with only minimal data associated, but all the information is there on the data on the on the scan. And now of course they're working through the bigger task of digitizing the data from the scan. Uh, bird specimens are quite different. you know you have usually this three-dimensional object, with a small two-dimensional tag on it that has data on both sides. And it's very, it's 
not at all amenable to quick digital capture. Um, insects are perhaps the biggest nightmare because you have you know, a small insect on a pin and under the insect on the pin, you may have four or five tiny labels written in microscopic script. And often those tags are all compressed together on the pin. And so there's quite a, a task of how can you even see those tags? And certainly, you know, how could you possibly digitize quickly the information on them? And so it's it's kind of a uh, a challenge that uh, needs to be solved specimen type by specimen type or taxon by taxon. Um, I think once the, the digital image has been captured, then things become more feasible. And we explored this in the West African Plants Project where once we had images, then it was pretty easy to set up a capture sheet whereby student interns um, looked at the image, spotted the country, okay, country here. Looked at the image, spotted the state, state here. Looked at the image, spotted the locality. And, and so that's a, that's a process that's more feasible but that initial digital capture can be very, very challenging. I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying it's challenging. Good, I think we don't, I can't see any hand or hands up. I, I think people have taken a good bite. They are full, they are energized, they are motivated <laughs> with essential biodiversity variables. And so, it is time to end today's session as well. But before then, I would like to use this opportunity to thank the project partners from Ghana, Liberia, Mauritania, Nigeria, WCMC, Nadine in particular, uh, JBF USA, Abigail, the KU, the Biodiversity Institute and the University of Kansas. I will also want to thank the HOD of the Ghana Biodiversity Information Facility, Professor T. Eboa, who had been with us for the uh, three sections. Um, JBIF Secretariat for the funding and for the interest in this course, I salute you. JBIF Africa for making sure that uh, most members of JPF Africa participated and also to communicate information about this uh, course to them. I am most grateful. Last, but certainly not the least, it's the biggest thank you to town as we affectionately calls him, Professor Andrew Town Peterson. He has been one person who has shown so much interest in Africa in building capacity in the area of wide diversity informatics. He has developed this program that continues to fund. He has provided all kinds of support. Um, and to me, it's not just a working partner, but a close associate and a friend. I, I, I am lost with words about what else to say, but uh, we are most grateful to him 
He has been very influential. He has been very supportive, making sure that we have the requisite capacity, we have the requisite data in Africa to be able to conserve, to be able to monitor, and to be able to study our biodiversity. Uh, in my part of the world, we will say, when you get up in the morning and you hear the first cock crow, then it is thus cause and its participants that are saying, thank you so much town. And we are very grateful. We say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure talking with you. It's been a, been a, been a wonderful way to start the morning uh, most days this week. So my very best regards to you all. And um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do my best to be of, of help if there are ideas and initiatives that come out of this. Thank you. And lastly, let me say that I will share all the resources about this course uh, so that we could all assess it as mm -hmm. when we want to make use of it also. And as much as possible, let's share the information to our colleagues at workplaces in various places so that we will derive the maximum benefit from this course. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. See you. Bye. Good health. Bye. 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 Bye.